you know, my, my lab works at the level of finding genes and then trying to figure out how they cause disease. And I'm not going to focus on the finding genes part. There are a lot of uh, people who have been actually a lot more successful than we have at finding genes in autism. But what I'll talk about is how we're trying to make sense of all that data, hence the title, Searching for Coherence. Um, these are my disclosures. No, nothing that I'm going to talk about today is related to them, but I put them up anyway because um, I'm supposed to. So I've organized my talk around three major questions. It's um, kind of a subset of what we're working on, but uh, hopefully these three questions and why we're asking them will become apparent. Can we use transcriptional networks to characterize the molecular pathology of a neuropsychiatric disorder? And I think it's important to frame this in the context of most medical disorders have pathology. You have pneumonia, there's a pathology that it was defined by looking under a microscope and seeing was that what was there. Neurology, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's, there's, all, there's a pathology. In psychiatric disorders, there is no such kind of coherent pathology. So we asked whether RNA might give us an insight into the state of the tissue that could serve as a somewhat as a molecular pathology of, of this disorder. Then can we use this once we identify what this phenotype, what this pathologic phenotype is, as a quantitative um, basis for comparison to cross disorders? In other words, how specific is this to autism? And thirdly, can we use this to understand when and where risk genes are acting or to inform disease modeling? So I'll go through these in order. But first, a brief introduction. So it's clear I'm here because neuropsychiatric disorders have significant genetic components. I'm going to try to use the pointer here a little bit. Let's see if that works. Oh, I've been told I can use this big one here behind, behind me. So I'll just use this. So um, these are common disorders. Um, schizophrenia and autism are down here at around 1%. Anxiety, major depression, and other ADHD, very high uh, percentage in the population, so they're afflicting uh, many of us and certainly people we know. Um, the heritability, based on family studies, that is the component that's inherited, is predicted to be very high. Again, autism, the, the range is fairly broad because the studies are fairly sm small, but around 60%, ranging from 40 to 80. Um, schizophrenia, much tighter, larger studies, so the confidence bounds are smaller. Now, if one does genome-wide genotyping and has single nucleotide polymorphisms throughout the genome, one can calculate how much those are contributing to the heritability. And one could see that a solid proportion, at least 50% around, of autism is contributed by common variation. And um, indeed, a lot of neuropsychiatric disorders have a substantial component from common variation. But as you know, there's also a large component from um, non-inherited de novo variation, and uh, structural and otherwise. But the major point that I want to mention here is these are common disorders that are not defined by etiology or any neuropathology, but by observation of behavior. So it was thought for decades that it was going to be impossible to find genes, that these diagnostic rubrics really had little meaning when it came to biology, which still may be true. But yet, as the sample sizes grew, and here's the schizophrenia with 37,000 samples, the number of common genetic loci identified it, um, increased. In fact, there's kind of an inflection point past which it seems that there's almost a linear relationship. But until you get there, there's almost nothing. And we could show the same thing with rare variation as well. And the point being here that as sample sizes get larger, we're finding more and more, we have more and more power. And so at some level, psychiatric genetics has been successful once the sample size has reached a large enough cohort. And even in major depression this year, which is, let's see, that red one there, there were three loci with 16,000. Now with over 100,000, there are about 45 loci. So again, there, there's, genes are being found. And um, you know, you've heard talks probably f uh, over the years from people who are doing sequencing, identifying rare variants. Um, and in autism, there are several hundred that have been identified. And I'll, I'll discuss that in a bit. But I just wanted to give a general overview.
Another thing that we can get from the common genetic variation is we can calculate a genetic correlation between these disorders. So you eliminate the shared ancestry, and then you can ask how correlated are people with these disorders. And so bipolar and schizophrenia, 60%. Autism, schizophrenia, almost 20%. So there's a, there's a substantial part of the heritab heritable component of these disorders that's actually shared. So this actually raises an interesting conundrum, and again, it gets to the point of the specificity of these diagnoses. What, it, what are the, you know, one of the questions we have to ask as we're identifying genes, what is specific and what is shared, and what does that actually mean from a neurobiological standpoint? And I'll keep coming back to that over and over again. So that's essentially the introduction, and now I'll tell you a little bit about autism. Of course, you probably, many of you may know more about this than I do, um, but um, I just want to make two points here, and then I'll move on quickly. One is that there's not one kind of form. There's not like, you know, autism isn't recessive. It's not all de novo. It's not all this additive common variation risk. Um, all of these things actually contribute. So far, the lowest hanging fruit and the most power has come from identifying what are essentially acting in a dominant fashion, de novo mutations that are not present in the parents, but that occur in the germline. If we kind of add this up, and this is what we did here, to figure out the percent of liability due to different classes of mutations. I want to be clear, this is not a prediction about how much they will contribute. This is a calculation about how much is known at this point. So if we look at a number of rare disorders, almost none of which account for more than 1 or 2%. In fact, most of the mutations that are recurrent that cause autism, such as mutations in CHD8, many all of these were discovered in the Simon Simplex um, collection. Um, together account for less than 1% of autism. If we add all of these up, in a population sense, we get about 3 or 4% can be identified at this point. And it's predicted that, again, common inherited variation would be about 50%, and there's about 40% that's unaccounted for. that just hasn't been measured in various ways, and I'm happy to discuss what that might be, but it's a slightly a, you know, a different question. I think it's uh, really speculative. So what we're essentially left with is a many genes, it's, it's predicted this is just the tip of the iceberg. Between 300 and 1,000 uh, genes will be hit by de novo mutations, possibly more. There's a very wide confidence bound uh, range around that, that estimate. None account for more than 1% of cases. There are highly additive effects as well, and there's strong pleiotropy, and that means that there's, it's not as if there are quote-unquote autism genes. These genes disrupt, my model is, they disrupt brain development and, and brain functioning, therefore imparting risk for these disorders, but it's not a one-to-one -one correspondence, so that many of these mutations cause a severe intellectual disability or epilepsy with and without autism, and some even, even contribute to schizophrenia. So the challenges to the genetics paradigm now are there's extreme heterogeneity at the population and individual levels, Genes don't act in isolation. They're components of biological signaling pathways. And in the brain, it's not just a, a cellular signaling pathway, but these neural networks. So the question is, can we identify areas of convergence? And at what level will that be? Will it be at molecular pathways, circuits, brain regions? And can we, within large dimensional data sets, genomic data sets that are related to key aspects of biological function or pathophysiology? And then, can we use these patterns to inform understanding of disease mechanisms or treatment development? That's essentially what I'm going to talk about, organized around those three questions. And again, the notion has been, this was published now oh, not quite 10 years ago, but the notion is what we really would like to do, and this is a, um, one view of, of a systems biology approach where you have data that ranges from complex phenotype data that's quantitative gene expression, epigenetic data, all of the genetic data that you would now get from whole genome sequencing, such as copy number and single nucleotide variant, and integrate this so as to get a causal model of how genes lead to the phenotypes and how they're related. So that's, a, that's the goal, and we're moving there, and I'll show you how we're very slowly moving there in, in our own clumsy way. So, but first, I need to tell you a caveat, especially because it's late in the afternoon, and some of you already may be falling asleep, I'm sure. So um, this is a caveat about finding meaningful patterns. This is the Virgin Mary toast. Um, 
you can go see this. It's, it, it's, on, um, it's on display. It was sold for $28,000, and um, it's on tour. It's not intended for consumption, as you can see. Now, when I look at this, I don't see the Virgin Mary. I see Madonna. And so it really got me to realize, you know, maybe this, you know, this, this could teach me something about pattern recognition. So I started to think about this religious theme a little more. And so I, I, you know, there are websites dedicated to Jesus in the food as well. Here's a Jesus potato chip. Here's a Jesus orange. And there's a Jesus naan. This is the best. Um, and so the question is, you know, does chance favor the prepared mind? You know, is this really the fact that we're, you know, and so, no, I think on the contrary, and I think believing is seeing. Eventually, random data will look like something you want to see. So we have to be very careful about that. We need to have robust methods for pattern detection and their interpretation. And we've thought about this a little bit. Um, there is quite a bit of noise in the network biology field, but we just have some very simple rules of thumb. If you have something real, it should be independently replicated in multiple gene expression data sets. You should be able to validate it using other independent data types. And of course, when possible, experimentally validate the predictions of the models that are derived from this. So with that kind of in mind, we then start to think about how are we going to use network biology to understand these systems level hierarchies within the, um, that might contribute to autism. So in the end, we have the behavior and cognition that defines autism. And all the way at this end, on the left, we have genetic variation. I'm going to be talking about networks that are primarily <laughs> based on mRNA, which is just one of the many intermediates connecting these levels. And that is one of the problems, is that we have to figure out how to connect genetic variation to its epigenetic modifications that lead to RNA abundance, that lead to proteins, synapses, circuits, et cetera. And this is really challenging, no doubt. We're just measuring what I'm going to be talking about today is mostly at this level. The reason I measure mRNA is not because it's the most interesting molecule. It's because it is feasible. It's tractable. It's a tractable quantitative intermediate phenotype that's very close to the genetic variation. I can measure it in large numbers of samples with high dynamic range, with great fidelity, fairly inexpensively. And so, the, and the other thing that we take into account is that genes don't act independently. They form networks. They can, you could think of the protein products of genes as being in biochemical pathways, but genes themselves have a structure. And here I'm just showing the correlation of genes that are artificially grouped into three groups. And from these, we look across samples. This could be 100 different human control brain samples. And we can ask, um, can we identify groupings or clusters of these genes? They, here's a gene set that covary together. From this covariance, we kind of assume, but we have to prove that they're co-regulated. And so from this, we can kind of identify, a, let's say, a grouping, a cluster. Within this cluster, there are genes that are more central, called hubs, and those that are outside that are um, uh, you know, you know, essentially not hubs. What's called a hub, though, is somewhat arbitrary. But as it turns out, when you do this experiment, and you, from hundreds of human brain samples, that, we, that Mike, this is actually, uh, Mike Oldham did this first, um, that other people had, had harvested and run microarrays on to measure RNA gene expression. The major source of variance in the tissue is cell type composition. And so what we end up pulling out are modules that correspond to the various cell types of the tissue. We're able to do an in silico dissection. So there are a lot of different ways to reduce the dimensionality of the data. Here I show principal component analysis that showing in two dimensions that when we do that, we can identify neurons, astrocytes, oligodendrocytes. And I'll show that to you a little bit later. But we use this method essentially based on correlation, but we could be using mutual information or other measures to, to build these networks. Another kind of piece of this, and uh, for those of you who are mathematicians in the group, this um, it will be obvious I'm not one. But um, this, is, this is actually from Barabasi, and this is one of the initial insights that got me interested in using in making gene networks. They had shown that, that at the protein level, protein networks obeyed scale-free topology, so that basically when you graph or map the way a protein network looks, it, it resembles an airline map rather than a road map. And 
And what that actually means is that the frequency of connectivity, which is k, is inversely proportional. This is a log-log, so there's an inverse power law um, relationship between the frequency of the number of connections that a node in this network has um, with the number of connections. And so it turns out that scale-free networks are a property of self-organizing systems. They're, and and it really, this, the, this text describes this graph. A small number of nodes have a large number of uh, connections. Most nodes have very few connections, and the few highly connected nodes are essential for the integrity of the network. So if we can boil down you know, 20,000 genes into a bunch of modules, and within those modules identify the key nodes, we've, we've simplified the problem to identify the drivers that are essentially for the integrity of the network. Does that make sense? So, um, you know, and of course, um, realistically, gene expression and protein networks don't fully obey scale-free topology because there's a hierarchical structure as well. And, and, and so there's a kind of combination. It's, 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 a, it's an integration of scale-free topology as well as a hierarchical structure that, uh, um, that kind of o over overrides <laughs> that. But, but this is a reasonable approximation. So just to give you an idea, the way when we started to do gene expression analysis, uh, again, about 18 years ago, um, in other disorders. The way that people do this is you take a control in an experimental group and you might have 10 cases and 10 controls and you, do, and you ask which genes are up and which genes are down. So you're looking for differential gene expression. And so you, you, you might do a t-test or, or some version <coughs> of that and um, you could see that these two uh, genes are not differentially expressed. So they're not interesting. They wouldn't come out from any differential expression analysis. And usually what happens is you end up with a list of genes. However, this is actually real data. You can see in the control that those two genes are highly correlated with each other. As one goes up, the other goes up and down. And in this experimental group, that correlational structure is lost. And so it's, it's this that we're taking advantage of when we're doing network biology. I'm not saying differential expression is not interesting because it still is very important. But it just shows how looking at the data from a slightly different direction can give you a different view of what's actually going on. So we're really looking about how genes co-vary together rather than whether they're just simply up or down. And so when Mike Oldham, when we, again, I mentioned this earlier, what I just want to make the point that there is, when we took samples done on different platforms to measure gene expression in human brain, these are the different modules that are identified. This is the correlational structure of the first principal component or eigengene of each module. There was a structure that was preserved in different data sets done on different platforms and different laboratories and different humans. And this is showing that correlation preservation, which is, you know, averages in the, in the 0.8 to 0.9. And so when, then when we, so this is a reproducible structure at the transcriptome level. And the reason this is important is because people, think you know, about the genome as being organized in this fashion, and you have proteins. People were thinking a lot about protein networks, but the notion is that you get a different view when you start to look at transcriptional networks, and, and I'm happy to discuss that later. But the fact that the transcriptome has an organization turns out to be important and very useful. And we could see that these modules clustered into the major cell types, different kinds of glia, different kinds of inhibitory and excitatory neurons as well as modules that corresponded to different types of synapses. And we could see this reproducibly. So one of the questions once we saw this was, is this structure disrupted in autism? Despite etiologic heterogeneity, I've told you that if I have 19 cases of autism, I'm likely to have 19 different genetic or environmental causes. Is there a shared pattern of pathology from post-mortem brain subject, uh, from subjects who had ASD? And so, um, so we've answered that question, I think, to some degree um, in, in several different ways. The first study was a microarray study with, that I'll discuss briefly, where we only had 19 subjects and about 20 controls. And this is showing clustering. The red is autism, the black is controls. And I was shocked when I saw this because I didn't expect that about 75% of the autism subjects showed a similar pattern. On the y-axis, is gene expression, red being up and green being down. So there was this kind of shared pattern at the mRNA level. We were able to reproduce this recently, about a year ago, 
um, and refine this somewhat, and I'll talk about that a little bit. We were also able to look at microRNA and saw a very similar pattern and could identify microRNAs that were, that were binding to and regulating some of the mRNAs that are dysregulated. And also, very importantly, we've looked at histone acetylation with Sean Prabhakar at Genome Institute of Singapore. This is all in post-mortem brain. And we've seen a shared pattern of histone acetylation, which I'll mention briefly. The reason why this is very important, I mean, as, aside from potentially giving us an intermediate mechanism that the histone structure is going to, and, and the histone marks are going to regulate gene expression, so they, they're highly correlated and largely underlie the gene expression changes. But what's interesting is that, you know, many people poo-pooed these data saying it's all post-mortem artifact due to RNA degradation. Well, there is no RNA in the histone acetylation. It's a totally different technology, and it, it, it does not have the same technical confounders as RNA sequencing, so it, it can't be that. So, so anyway, I'll go through this really quickly because this has been published before, but I just, I wanted to show this just to get to some other interesting stuff, just to remind you. So in the first microarray study, Irina Vonnegu found two modules that were dysregulated in autism. One that we ca called M12, they're just numbered um, you know, arbitrarily, and the other called M16. And um, M12 is a neuronal module that involves a lot of GABAergic markers, including parvalbumin, somatostatin, which are among the most downregulated genes. We also saw splicing dysregulation, and RBFOX1 was one of the hubs of this module, which is a neuronal-specific splicing regulator. And then we saw upregulation of microglia and astrocyte genes, which was called by gene ontology to be an immune or inflammatory response. But really, we had, we knew what the normal microglia response was in the brain from Mike Oldham's study, and that module highly overlapped with that. And so it just, it shows how the gene ontology, especially for nervous system ontologies, is still somewhat primitive. So our notion at this time, and again, I want to frame this in terms of a molecular neuropathology, is that just three quarters of our cases share this pattern at the transcriptome level, which to us distinguish it from controls. So our way of thinking about this, and again, this comes from my MD side, we can, you know, cancer is a disorder of proliferation and invasion. Asthma is a disease of hyperreactive airways. Stroke is a disorder of acute brain hypooxygenation. In this context, what is autism? I mean, at some level, we can define this pathologically in that there's an altered neuronal gene expression pattern and there's an increased microglia astrocyte gene of, of markers for those. And so the notion was we were able to show... So, so one thing I should make clear that I, I skipped over quickly is that when we measure a transcriptome from patients in the brain, we don't know if that's a cause or consequence. It could be because they have this because they had autism. One way to get a causal anchor is to ask, is genetic variation, either common or rare, enriched in, in one of these particular modules? In other words, do the genes that cause autism, are they mutated in either M12 genes or M16 genes? And it turned out that they were much more likely to be in M M12, highly significantly genome-wide, but not at all in M16. And yet, every, in every patient where we saw M12 go uh, down, we saw M16 go up. There was about a 0.8 correlation. So these are tightly interwoven, but our causal anchor starts in an alteration in neuronal function that leads to a dyshomeostasis and microglia inflammation. And now we know a lot more about microglia that microglia are involved in synaptic pruning and synaptic development. So this is not inflammation as it would occur outside of the brain, but much more likely due to synaptic pruning and synaptic dyshomeostasis. And so that's the, the kind of underlying very, very broad brush model. And so we've been able to reproduce this signature now in 113 cases and controls that includes a major gene form of autism which is 15Q1113 duplication, which is almost 1% of autism in the AGREE sample. These are highly correlated. But using RNA sequencing, we're also able to look at long non-coding RNA, which was missed initially, microRNA and splicing changes. 
And the point that I'm bringing up there all the way to the right is that these, you may not be able to read it so well, but I'm just going to point out, this is differential gene expression, first principal component. This is differential um, long non-coding RNA, and this is differential splicing. And they're highly correlated. The R square is over 0.8. This tells me that there's likely a unitary process that's ongoing that involves all of these forms of molecular dysregulation. And when we look, we can show that this is due to diagnosis and not due to many of the confounding factors that can bias transcriptome studies. We can see that this isn't present in, in other, this, this is Alzheimer's disease. And, and, and this is showing the autism in, in controls uh, versus DUP15Q. And what you can see is that the changes in DUP15Q are highly correlated, but with a higher slope, so that they're, they're more consistent and they're slightly more homogeneous and larger in 15Q duplication, but highly correlated with those that are occurring in idiopathic autism. We also see the shared pattern of splicing. And again, I'll show you in the next slide, hopefully, that you can see, again, it's not it doesn't completely separate autism from controls. It separates about two-thirds. It involves alternative splicing and misregulation. Actually, it involves the exclusion of multiple exons that are normally um, alternatively spliced in a number of known autism risk genes. And what's super interesting about this is that it's neuron-specific. This is not occurring in glial genes. It's 95% are neuronal genes, genes that are only expressed in neurons. And when we compare the cerebral cortex, we profiled frontal lobe and temporal lobe to cerebellum. We find that the changes in cerebellum are not significant at all. They're incredibly weak, whereas in temporal lobe and frontal lobe, they're highly correlated. We can also ask, okay, if these splicing changes are occurring, that means they're splicing fact, they're regulated by specific proteins that are called splicing factors. And so are those splicing factors dysregulated or are these genes enriched in those, um, the genes that have alternative splicing enriched? And so if we see these exon exclusion events in autism are highly enriched in RBFOX1 targets, these are experimentally determined. This SRRM4, PDBP1, all of which are neuronal splicing factors as well as activity dependent events. So we're able to take published data from Ben Blanco and several other labs, not in human, in mouse, and we could still see that our activity-dependent events, when you give KCL to a cell or in a mouse with seizures, that there was a very strong overlap with activity-dependent events. So that, um, and what I didn't mention to you is the same thing with the differential mRNA expression. So that we, we have a signal for activity-dependent changes that are occurring here. Does that make sense? To some degree, hopefully. So another thing that we had seen originally is that when you compare frontal lobe to temporal lobe in controls, there were 510 genes differentially expressed in our 2011 paper, and only eight in autism at the same statistical threshold. And the question is, is this do, does this replicate? This was a fairly small sample size, so now we're able to replicate this in a larger sample size. And what we find is that in autism, there are tenfold fewer genes differentially expressed at the same, at a very stringent false discovery rate. So we're able to really replicate the fact that the normal patterns of gene expression that differentiate the frontal and temporal lobe are also attenuated in autism. So we wanted to understand this a little bit more. And so we did gene ontology of, of this attenuation of cortical patterning set, or ACP set which is about 500 or so genes. It's actually 527, I think, that are, that are unique to this set. And the top pathway was Wnt receptor signaling, which is a developmental patterning pathway. So we searched through. We were wondering, could we identify potentially a potential driver of this and what might be going on? Could it be that early disruption of neurodevelopmental events would affect uh, cortical lamination and patterning? And so... We first did a bioinformatic analysis of the transcription factor binding sites in the five prime region of, of, of this, I guess it wasn't 517, it was 523 um, genes that are not differentially expressed between frontal and temporal lobe and autism, but are in controls. And we found three transcription factors that were enriched. 
And what's interesting is SOX5 is a Wnt transcription factor known to be involved in, cort in cortical patterning. And it's involved in cell cycle progression and neural progenitor proliferation. And many autism candidate genes also are likely to affect similar pathways. When we looked in our autism samples, if SOX5, you know, we reasoned that if SOX5 were to be involved, it, it, its differential expression should also be attenuated, and it was. And this is shown here. You can see that in the autism samples, that it's not differentially expressed, whereas in the controls, um, it highly, highly differentially expressed. So then we overexpress SOX5, which is a transcriptional repressor, in human primary neural progenitors, and we're able to show that just that one experiment after 48 hours led to differential expression of 20% of the ACP gene set, which was hugely significant overrepresentation. So I think we can say that at least part of this patterning is likely due to dysregulation of SOX5. So we can also do network analysis. And we can begin to say, can we learn more in this new, much larger data set? And again, here, instead of just two modules, we identified five modules that were differentially regulated in autism, three that were down and two that were up. And just to cut a long story short, these two were the previous neuroinflammatory glial, M9 being astrocyte, M19 being um, microglia, and these three being neuronal modules, the previous M12. So we're able to replicate them and also refine. And that's just shown here by a gene set enrichment analysis. There are a lot of other interesting things in this paper, but, I, but one of the most interesting to me was the fact that we now had, in our previous study, we only had 19 cases, and we really saw no relationship of the gene expression changes with age. But now we have about a dozen cases under age 10. And so we're actually able to see, especially with several of the modules, but specifically I'm showing the microglia M19 module. The black is the normal control trajectory. So what this shows is that normally with development, this module is downregulated. And so the upregulation of microglia and astrocytes that we're seeing is a failure of the normal developmental downregulation. This is the autism shown in red here. And so what happens is normally this these are very active with synaptic pruning and plasticity early in life, and this is downregulated. But in autism, this stays elevated. So to summarize this, we confirmed a shared molecular pathology in autism in a threefold larger sample. We find the same basic molecular pathology. We see neuronal specific splicing dysregulation in parallel with protein coding genes, both of which have a large activity dependent component. This pattern is recapitulated in patients with 15Q duplication, which again is really important. We, but the main point about that last slide was that our developmental trajectory suggests that there's a persistence of early developmental patterns. And this raises the question, is there a treatment window in that first decade or two when this microglia module is still elevated? And maybe, you know, again, we don't know whether it's adaptive or maladaptive, but it, it presents a potential treatment opportunity, and that this may be something that is targetable. It's telling us that there's an ongoing process that is going on in autism that has been downregulated in controls. So again, I mentioned to you before that we're able to confirm that histone H3K27 acetylation, which is a marker of active enhancers, and that is about 0.7 correlated with gene expression, also separated the cases from controls shown here, red and blue, as well as this is temporal cortex and frontal cortex, highly correlated with each other. We could see in 15Q duplication, again, there was the differential acetylated peaks, both in prefrontal cortex and temporal cortex, were also highly correlated. So we're able to identify at least a potential intermediary um, of this gene expression. But the important point here is that this distinguished the cases from controls very substantially, just like the gene expression. And again, the confounders, technical confounders, are quite distinct. So now that we have this pattern that we're fairly confident in, it doesn't describe all of autism, but it's there in a majority of patients, at least 50%, actually right now about two-thirds, but we, 
don't have, you know, we don't know what the real confidence limits there. And so it's important to, uh, to look at this in more brain samples. There's really a lot more to do. But it's a starting point, and I'm going to show you a few experiments that we've done and how we've begun to use this as a way to begin to explore various um, aspects of autism. So what can we learn about sex differences in autism? One, um, um, you know that there are th about 3.5 uh, males to females risk. So the question is, um, are the genes that are mutated in autism differentially expressed in a sexually dimorphic way? Or is there something about these patterns that we see in autism that's sexually dimorphic? So we asked that question, and the answer was really quite striking. That what's shown here on the y-axis is a fold difference. So male is up and autism is up above the one, and anything that's down in autism or down in males would be down. And so I know it's a slightly weird way of graphing it, but we wanted to, to <coughs> illustrate this. And what one can see is that the sex differentially expressed genes, genes that are up in males, which are in blue, are also those that are up in autism. And these are mostly those glial astrocyte genes. And again, when we look at the down genes, those are genes that are down in males or up in females. So it's, it's really consistent. It's not 100%, but it's really a very high proportion, unmistakable. So genes that are up in male brain are enriched for those upregulated in autism, postmortem brain, this M16. So now the question is, is this due to some sexual dimorphism in the, in the, in the genes that are mutated? So we can ask that at this point um, by asking if we took autism candidate genes from Safari or genes with protein disrupting <coughs> rare de novo mutations in autism, genes with pro that have both protein disrupting and missense in autism. FMRP interacting genes, all of these have been associated with autism. And none of them are enriched in the male differentially expressed genes. If we just ask, are these genes differentially expressed between male and female? Both in adult brain and in fetal brain, same results. I'm just showing adult here. But what one can see again is that the genes that are up in autism relative to controls are enriched in the male differentially expressed genes and again in this up module as well. So our conclusions from this is that there's no evidence to date of sex differential expression for ASD risk genes, certainly those with large effect sizes. And that might be expected since there isn't a lot of sexual dimorphism in those large effect size mutations. But instead, sexually dimorphic genes in cortex are enriched in those upregulated male brain and astrocyte and microglia markers. And so our model is that autism risk variants encounter naturally occurring sexually dimorphic brains, which may account for the sex skewed prevalence. In other words, this is encountering the female protective factors or the male risk factors. It depends on, on how you want to look at it. Does that make sense? We can argue about this later if you want, and I'll finish. Okay. So uh, another question is, can we use this network-based framework as a quantitative phenotype for cross-disorder comparisons? I showed you how we can begin to use these modules and networks to understand sexual dimorphism or sexual, the, uh, the risk for autism. But can we use this as a quantitative phenotype? And the reason why this, again, is so important, I, I believe, is because when we're, when we're looking across patients, we have schizophrenia, bipolar, they're, they're usually ascertained by different groups using different measures. What are you going to be measuring? You know? So if we had you know, quantitative measures of brain volume or we knew what the endophenotypes were that we wanted to measure, the cognitive features, it would be really powerful. But we don't have that. But the transcriptome is a cognitive, is a quantitative brain-based phenotype. And so this is work done by Mike Gandell, who actually has a Simons Bridge to Independence Award. And um, I can tell you it's well-placed wonderful uh, new psychiatrist. So the idea here is that you have autism, and this, sorry about the slide, it's the 16 by nine, that's one that I missed. You know, you have the clinical syndromes, you have etiology, which can be multifactorial. And we're looking at this as an altered brain transcriptome as an intermediate phenotype. And of course, whoops, a lot of, you know, what's driving this is this n notion of this shared genetic risk that I showed you in one of the early slides. This is the PGC data showing that again, Schizophrenia and bipolar 
has about a, you know, here it's lower because there's less data, but about a 20% shared uh, coheritability. Even autism and schizophrenia here are about uh, 5 or 10%. It's, it's much higher now with, with better data. But just this, this really begged the question, how about this? How about this phenotype? And so Mike spent over a year downloading over 800 samples from the web, from different studies, and very carefully quality controlling, balancing, normalization. And then he did differential gene expression to find what's up and down, as well as network analysis. So we did a global transcriptome comparison, which I'm going to show you first, looking at the correlation between these transcriptomes, as well as we did a network analysis to ask what cell types or modules are changing. So if we look at the global transcriptome overlap, one can see that schizophrenia and bipolar have about a 0.7 correlation, autism and schizophrenia about a 0.5 correlation, bipolar and autism less. This is not significant after correction, but autism and IBD have a slight correlation that's driven by the upregulation of inflammatory genes that actually have different functions in these two different tissues. One, microglia and autism, IBD, these immune cells, monocyte-derived macrophage. No relationship to alcoholism. It's not correlated with any of these. And that's important because alcoholism has a lot of the same transcript or, you know, confounders as these other disorders. So then we asked, and, and believe me, we spent a year, well, you don't have to believe me, but you can just look at the paper, but um, th th that should come out soon, but, and, 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 but I'm happy to discuss it in detail. We, we did every manner. We even did, sur you know, we used surrogate variables, we used peer, we used, you know, to correct for hidden covariates, and we still end up with these results. So it's, it's, it's very unlikely they're being driven by, by any kind of um, confounders. However, what we then asked, what is driving this? Could it be driven by genetic overlap? And what's remarkable is, is the correlation, almost 50% of the variance. If, if we look on the y-axis, we have the transcriptome correlation of any two disorder pairs. And on the x-axis, the genetic SNP-based correlation of those same pairs. We have the mic original microarray data and the new RNA sequencing data that we produced for this study with the PsycEncode consortium, including some new areas of cerebral cortex. And what we can see is that there's, there's really a very strong correspondence between the underlying genetic SNP-based correlation and the transcriptome correlation, so that about 50% of this variance is explained by genetics. Again, another piece of information that this is not a confounding factor. Um, of course, it doesn't prove it. It's just a correlation. But, it, but the parsimonious explanation would be that the same genetic risk leads to similar transcriptome changes. Now, I should say that very few of these are actually EQTL. Very few of the SNPs are ac and, and, trans and transcripts that are differentially expressed are being driven directly. So what we're actually seeing is the multi-layered development of a transcriptome dysregulation based on develop you know, what we presume, and I'll show you in a bit, is developmental dysregulation due to the genetics. So again, we can do network analysis and we identify a bunch of neuronal and glial modules and other modules corresponding to different functions. There are these three glial modules and four downregulated neuronal modules. And we can begin to ask how specific are these to these disorders. So we can see that autism has these four neuronal modules downregulated. Those are the first four shown there. Alcohol abuse doesn't look anything like that. But schizophrenia looks very similar. It, the the downregulation of gene expression is, is far less severe. It's about a third but it, it, it's quite the same modules are down, as you can see here. The astrocyte, which is the yellow module, is upregulated, but the microglia module is very strong regulated, upregulated in autism, but not in schizophrenia or the other disorders. So right now, the microglia looks relatively specific to autism. And again, we can now, I'm just going to give you an example of the ways we can now take these modules, and now we want to ask, well, what, what might be the underlying biology? Are these related to excitation inhibition balance or neuronal activity? And so we can do that at multiple scales. We've done this before at the meso scale, identifying genes that are correlated with brain network activity in functional MRI. And we showed that default mode network activity correlated genes are enriched in these four neuronal modules, 
that are downregulated in autism, schizophrenia, and bipolar. And at a micro scale, in a paper in molecular systems biology a number of years ago, we identified a number of modules related to neuronal firing rate. This is the mean firing rate in spikes per second. And this is just showing two of those modules here. And what we can see is that one of these modules is this purple module that's downregulated across autism, bipolar, and schizophrenia, and upregulated in alcoholism. So again, we have evidence from multiple sources that neuronal firing rate or neuronal activity is certainly a component of some of the gene expression, downregulation of neuronal gene expression changes that we're seeing. So it's rep what we're seeing in the molecular pathology is a kind of circuit level disruption of activity. And that's, that's the hypothesis or the model, what we're looking at. Now we can also, as we've done before, ask where are the genetic drivers? And here we can see that the turquoise module is enriched for rare variants. And we've taken rare variants very broadly, non-synonymous de novo variants in autism, schizophrenia, in their siblings, silent de novo variants which show no signal, and recurrent copy number variants which show a strong signal of enrichment in this turquoise module. So the rare variants are super enriched in this turquoise, not super, but statistically significantly enriched in this um, turquoise module. We can also ask about common variants. And again, similar to what we showed in the earlier autism papers, we can take the GWAS summary statistics from the GWAS of these disorders. We use magma, to, which corrects for gene length and a lot of other factors to get a gene level significance. And we can ask, how is the significance of a gene related to its module membership or the relationship to the module eigengene? And what we see is that in the autism eyesight GWAS that's unpublished as of yet, there's a significant enrichment in the, um, um, that's negative log 10 FDR, the negative is missing, but um, of the eyesight GWAS shown here, educational attainment, which has also been shown to be related to autism risk, as well as schizophrenia, and a little bit in, in, in neuroticism. So these, these modules are, you know, again, this, this speaks to the pleiotropy of the genetic variation that is leading to these disorders. But again, it's showing that the genetic risk is sitting in neuronal modules, but the glial response is a critical component of the neuropathology that's persistent. So the cross-disorder summary is that we've defined the molecular pathology of multiple major neuropsychiatric disorders. And this highlights pathways. I didn't get a chance, but it's really interesting to look at each of these specifically. As I mentioned, autism, schizophrenia, and bipolar share overlapping gene expression patterns, including the astrocyte upregulation. Um, but autism shows the specific signature of microglia upregulation. And the degree of this cross-disorder overlap was strikingly related to the genetic overlap among disorders, which demonstrates a significant contribution of common genetic factors to these molecular pathologic measures. So we're kind of excited about this, but there's a lot more dissection that needs to be done in terms of understanding what cell types this comes from. Can we recapitulate this in model systems? Can we alter activity in very specific ways, for example, alter EI balance and create some of these patterns? And um, there's, you know, I'll just leave it at that, and, and I'll get to that in the next few moments. So the next question is, can we use gene networks to understand, can we use these networks where risk genes are acting or to inform disease modeling? So the question we asked here is fundamentally different than the question we asked in the postmortem brain, which is subsequent to having autism. Here we asked, do autism risk genes converge on any biological time point or developmental process or cell type? So here we're looking at normal development and asking, can we find enrichment for autism risk? And we're querying here neurotypical brain networks. And the way we did this is we took RNA sequencing data from the BrainSpan resource, which is eight weeks fetal gestation through three years of age, and we created neurotypical networks. So we go from 20s or 30s, thousands of genes. We define the statistical association, this correlational measure between these genes, and that enables us to cluster modules. We then define the modules, and these share function. And so we go from thousands of genes to tens of modules. And each of these, again, represents a cell type, a biological process, et cetera. So then we can ask, 
in any of these modules do we find a co-occurrence of risk genes? Is there convergence at this molecular level? Where are the genes of interest? In blue here. And let's just pretend in this cartoon they were all mostly in that yellow module. That would be an enrichment. Now the issue is what is the yellow module? What's it doing? So to, we, to understand the biology, because this has all been created from the ground up, we're not using known annotations. We're just looking at the correlational structure of the data, letting it define the modules. And then we ask, what is their gene ontology? What pathways? What cell types? So we can move across biological levels, space and time, physical interaction, and gene regulation. This is an example of space and time. So here's the yellow module eigengene, the first principal component. This is birth. You can see this is a gene that's really high during fetal development and then drops after birth and stays low. We can see that there's some um, enrichment in certain brain regions, certain cell types, et cetera. And so we, we run through this exercise to identify the regions, the cell types, the circuits, and the biological processes that these genes are disrupting. And so again, the first uh, foray at this was published in 2013. It was work as part of Neil Parikshak's graduate thesis. And essentially, we, he identified reproducibly in multiple data sets these 18 modules and then asked, where do safari autism risk genes lie? Where do our ASD M12 genes lie? Those are the ones that were uh, downregulated in autism. How about intellectual disability genes? There were 400 genes known to cause intellectual disability. Where do those lie? Then we have the work from um, the Simon Simplex collection. RDNV affected genes in affecteds, missense, protein disrupting, protein disrupting plus missense, and then in siblings. And one can see that we see a signal in M2 and M3 for both protein disrupting and missense separately as well as together with odds ratios that range between 1.6 and 3.1, all significant. These are all FDR corrected p-values. And what this is telling us is that these genes are acting differently from these ASDM12, which is where the common genetic risk is being harbored, or the safari genes, which are enriched in M13, M16, and M17, especially in M16, where the odds ratio is almost five. So what are these? What is this M2 and M3? So again, these are harboring de novo rare mutations that can be missense or protein disrupting. And so this is plotting the first principal component of M2 and M3. One can see they're highly expressed before birth, birth being the red line, and they're enriched in transcription factors and things involving regulation of transcription and chromatin structure. This one's very early during cortical neurogenesis peaks around, oh, 18 or 19 weeks in the human. It starts around eight weeks. So this is something that's involved in, likely involved in progenitor proliferation, expansion of the, pro of, of the progenitor pool, and very early neurogenesis. This reaches a peak at about the time that that's dropping and stays up during cortical neurogenesis, probably more involved in the neuronal fate and the secondary progenitor pools. That's just a hypothesis. We then went and asked, okay, if these modules or transcriptional regulation really mean something, then they should be, um, uh, we should be able to see them at the protein level, and indeed we do using the DAPL tool. We see that each of these modules is reproduced at the PPI level, even though PPIs from this kind of tissue are very, very you know, sparse. One of the interesting things is that a gene that we didn't detect, topoisomerase 1, which, which uh, uh, transcribes long genes, is one of the hubs of this module, and that module was substantially enriched in the BAF complex members, which is a chromatin modifier involved in neurogenesis. In fact, seven of the 28 BAF complex members, and this is as of 2012, really, <coughs> harbored at least one de novo mutation, and they're in that module. They're the hubs of that module. So we're talking about very early neurogenesis and chromatin modification. When we look at inherited risk, we see that it's in slightly later processes related to synaptic development, and that these, this is also the set of genes that are downregulated in M12 and these new modules identified in the RNA sequencing. So we see that the risk has a different kind of architecture. We can ask, are ASD-associated modules co-regulated? The reason is coherent biological processes should be co-regulated. We can predict the transcription factor binding sites using motif analysis, so we can scan the promoter regions. We can identify the transcription factor binding sites. 
We can even validate that using chip data or for RNA binding, clip data. And we can assess enrichment in modules over background. So we can actually ask, are, are these modules, some that are up, some that are down, being co-regulated? And, and what we find is yes, at the transcriptional level, we're able to find numerous two, two members of the MEF family, SATB1, BCL6, all involved in neurogenesis that are linking M2, M3, and these later modules. And this is the actual chip validation data shown there. So it's validated experimentally. And of course, earlier in the 2012 paper in Iosifov et al., they, um, Mike Wiggler's group had shown that fMRP-bound transcripts are enriched for rare de novo hits. So we asked, are these, are these modules being linked by fMRP at the translational level? And the answer, again, is yes. So both at the transcriptional and translational level, we're talking about a coherent biological process. So to summarize this work that was, again, published several years ago, autism genes from multiple sources converge on prenatal neurodevelopmental processes that transcriptional and translational co-regulation link them at multiple levels, that multiple autism risk gene modules are enriched, and I didn't show you these data, in cortical glutamatergic projection neurons, and in our data, in superficial neurons. And these patterns highlight features that distinguish autism from ID. And I'm happy to discuss that further because um, that's an interesting issue that you'll see in the next slide. So the real question is, this is 2013. The first two exome sequencing papers have been published. We have very few really bona fide risk genes, fewer than a dozen at this point. So what do we do? Well, do these predict anything? And here we've taken the new data that's come out from Iosifov and Sanders and Matt Hurl's group at Cambridge. This is developmental delay writ large. It's not specific. It could be ID, it could be autism, it's everything. This is Iosifov missense, Iosifov gene disrupting, super enriched in M2 again. The Sanders study, an odds ratio close to four, and then in a study that Dennis Wall presented here at the last Simons meeting um, last spring, um, the iHeart study where we've been sequencing the Agree families, we also see enrichment of rare de novo mutations in M2 and M3. But interestingly, because we're also picking up a signal from lower effect size inherited non de novo mutations, just like before in Neil's study, we're seeing an enrichment in N16 here as well. So our model now is, you know, makes total sense in terms of evolution. What's shown on the left, this is a slide from Jim Lupsky review, basically shows that things that are very common that are, are ancient in the population because natural selection has removed bad actors from the population. So things that have very large and negative effects on development and procreation are much, likely, much more likely to be recent and rare, if not de novo. And the developmental M2 and M3 are enriched in those genes, whereas the M16 and developmental M16 are enriched in the smaller effect size genes. And one can see that this actually parallels what's known about regulatory architectures or proposed in terms of having these kind of three major tiers where the M2 and M3 are the top tier regulators and they, therefore they have the largest effect and the most pleiotropy. And then the bottom tier is where these M16 and M13, M17 sit. So the genetic architecture parallels a molecular regulatory architecture and it makes total sense in light of evolution. But this really highlights the need for a very refined understanding of regulatory networks. Just like we wanted to understand signaling pathways in cancer, now we kind of know where we need to look. At least one area is we need to understand neural cell lineage specification and cortical development, because that's where a lot of the risk is, and we really don't have a good regulatory map of that. So a, lo a lot of what my lab has been working on the last five years for several regions, reasons, that being one of them, is actually developing a regulatory map, separating the proliferating essentially germinal zones from the cortical plate developing and looking at making maps of chromatin accessibility, what's being transcribed, chromatin interactions, that is looking at distal, very distant re regulatory interactions as well as gene expression and sequencing. And I just uh, refer you to two um, references there, but this is something that we think is gonna be critical. It's also gonna be critical to understand how non-coding regulation is actually exerting its effect. 
so that these maps that we make tie enhancer elements to very distal genes, sometimes almost a megabase away. And without having these maps, we actually don't know what gene a regulatory variant is actually affecting. So in the last 42 seconds that I have, maybe I'll go one minute over, I want to ask how now can we use these networks that are showing convergence, both in terms of mutations and in terms of molecular pathology to inform disease modeling. And I'll skip over this quickly so we can have more question time. But one of the first questions we asked is, okay, we have these patterns, now we want to know how they arise. And we want to know how they arise in a human system. So we started to use primary neural progenitors and IPS-derived neurons about four years ago. And these were two-dimensional cultures grown in a dish. And we realized at that time that nobody had actually assessed how these model in vivo development in any fundamental way. And so we, we realized that because we were using primary neural progenitors and not focusing on IPSC, the, the field would insist that we prove this. So we actually used gene networks to ask how well do my cells model in vivo development and what is actually modeled. So we developed three tools to do this. One is what we call transition mapping. We're just using a rank-rank hypergeometric test that basically asks if we take in vivo data, and these are various stages from brain span, so this is in vivo cerebral cortex, from you know, each stage, um, stage uh, eight is birth, uh, stage seven is 24 weeks to 38 weeks, five is like mid-gestation, and then 13 is you know, adults. So you can look and, you, and, we, and we can ask what kind of transitions are, being, are occurring in my culture. If I compare my week one versus 12 weeks of differentiation or eight weeks, what stages are being mapped here? And so the brightest red rank rank is showing. So this is showing that in vitro, the best we're doing and the best anybody was doing is one to six. So that means we're going to about 24 week post conception. We got cell lines from the major stem cell labs and we, nothing was getting, was, was coming close to even uh, um, the third trimester really. So, um, and I'll talk about that in a second, why that's so important. We developed and validated a machine learning tool called Context. It's just a black box machine learning support vector machine that determines the developmental maturity and regional identity of a tissue. And the way it kind of works is we started with a large data set from in vivo and then asked in four other data sets, can we, can we predict what tissue we have? And so we were able to predict with very high accuracy the stage of the tissue and its developmental uh, time very, very closely with pretty, uh, the accuracies are listed there. So now we apply this to our samples and what was funny is that a lot of the samples that have been published and called cerebral cortical because they express the gene PAC6, which is a marker for cerebral cortical progenitors, but it's also a marker for cerebellar granule cells. The majority of those actually looked much more like at a transcriptome level, like cerebellum, than they did like cortex. We classified them as cerebellum. Then the third tool we use is our network, whole genome co-expression network analysis, and we can identify modules that correspond to various aspects of neurodevelopment. This would be a gliogenesis module. This is a synaptic development and axon outgrowth module, et cetera. And what we found is that many of the de novo genes that have been identified in chromatin modifiers were reproduced expression in this midnight blue, very early neurogenesis module. And so we have confidence now that at least some of these chromatin modifiers can be looked at in two-dimensional cultures. But many of the other genes that are later expressed, we're not going to have great synaptic activity. So we started to work with Sergio Pasco over the last year to develop cultures, and he's developed them, that are much older. And this is showing up to day 463 in vitro. And one can see by these rank-rank maps that we're getting into seven stages, seven and eight, and beyond, and some of the transitions that are going on here are really quite mature, like between stage three and 10, which is adult. And we're able to see that these modules, the chromatin remod you know, remodeling happens very early. This is where most of the de novo hits are, then neuronal migration, and that stops, et cetera, then gliogenesis goes up later. So I'll end. So this is by using the transcriptome, and many neurobiologists don't like the transcriptome. I get I don't know why, 
It's an unbiased way of looking at the whole genome. So we decided to, look, to use another method. There's a colleague of mine developed an epigenetic clock, which is the most accurate predictor of age. And using this, we can show that differentiation day is linearly related to DNA methylation age, so that by the time we get to 300, we're in around one to two years of age. And by single cell analysis of fetal human brain and comparing that to Sergio's cultures from his nature paper, we're able to show that we have the majority of the you know, same composition of excitatory upper lower layer neurons and inhibitory neurons in these three-dimensional cultures as we see in, in vivo. So what we're doing now is growing these cultures from patients with different forms of risk, low and high polygenic risk, make, using genome engineering to make mutations. But also we can ask, we have a transcriptional profile. Can we identify drugs that can reverse that profile? The idea is that at the Broad, they've given 1,300 FDA-approved compounds to cells and measured the transcriptome. And we can compare and match patterns and try to identify patterns that have predicted drugs that would reverse that pattern. So we've done that in a neural repair paradigm. And for time, I won't go through that. I'll just refer you to the paper, um, which really is a, is a strong proof of principle. But now what we're working on is reverse engineering of disease networks from large-scale gene perturbation data. So we can identify drugs that induce network gene expression patterns or reverse them. None of them are going to be complete because they're only hitting certain pathways. We can validate the drug engagement and disease biology in vitro. We can map the validated drugs back to the network genes by doing transcriptional profiling. We can functionally confirm their involvement using genome editing. And then we can kind of parse apart the key aspects of the network that we're hitting. So we're hopeful that this may be one pathway to begin to develop sets of drugs or at least integrative pathway analysis that could lead to drugs based on these transcriptomes. So I apologize for the long-windedness, um, but I, I do want to emphasize we're on the threshold of identifying hundreds of causal genetic factors for most neuropsychiatric disorders. I hope I've shown you that the network approaches provide at least one way of organizing the data, defining molecular pathologies, and we can capitalize on genetic findings using the convergent evidence from these networks to begin to elucidate the neural system's basis of autism and other psychiatric disorders. I think I've gone over that already, but I also think that these approaches provide a framework for beginning to think about mechanisms and, and for assessing whether your model system is actually recapitulating what you want to. So I have to thank all the people in my lab. I think I mentioned Neil and Mike and Vivek and Grant. Um, Jason and Luis did the stem cell work. Hei Jung has been working on chromatin structure. I have a long-standing collaboration with Steve Horvath at UCLA who developed the network methods that we use and a new collaboration with Sergio Pasca at Stanford that's been very exciting. Um, the autism data that I used is from a new GWAS from the iSight Consortium, which is a population-based consortium in uh, Denmark. And there's my lab in its little Explorer capsule. I thought this was kind of a corny way, a corny metaphor for you know, going where no person has gone before or something, but not, not, not using a trademark. So um, I have to thank the Psych Encode project where we got a lot of the data that we use for the cross-disorder analysis as well as brain span. Thanks for your attention.